oceans cover more than 70% of the surface of the Earth. They host the largest volume of life on our planet. Their richest biodiversity is found where the seabed nears the surface. Through eons, shallow areas like coral reefs have provided the setting for a fantastical multitude of creatures to evolve. Shallow coastal waters are also the most productive since they receive nutrients from land, rivers, and estuaries. These nutrients nourish huge food webs of underwater plants and animals that thrive along the shores of continents and islands. Around the world, such nearshore habitats also provide over 90% of the fish that humans consume. In short, to continue to thrive in a world of beautiful and bountiful oceans, we must understand, cherish, and sustain these vast and precious shallow areas, known as large marine ecosystems. Along the southwest coast of Africa, kelp forests thrive in the cold waters of the Benguela Current. The Benguela is a temperate and bountiful large marine ecosystem. An enormous upwelling of nutrients enriches its waters and supports a lengthy food chain. It provides food security for seabirds and the world's largest populations of Cape fur seal. The Antarctic large marine ecosystem surrounds Earth's coldest and most pristine continent. In this harsh environment, many unique animals live close to the shore, dependent on shallow coastal waters for their very survival. Without caution, international fleets fishing in this region could inflict immense damage on this fragile marine ecosystem. At the other end of the spectrum are the warm tropical waters. Here in the Agalas and Somali current large marine ecosystem, abundant mangroves are ideal breeding places for birds, as well as fish. Coastal waters provide rich sources of protein for millions of people the world over. Nearly everywhere, artisanal fishers have mastered intricate skills to feed themselves and their families from the sea. Human cultural development too has been deeply influenced through the association of humans with the sea. Apart from linking distant parts of the world by means of boats and ships, marine ecosystems provide valuable resources for the survival of humankind. No wonder human populations thrive along the coasts of the world. A few kilometers from the resort hotels of Salvador, Brazil, a fisher sets off in the direction of a submerged reef. The city is drenched by intermittent rains, but no one can afford to wait for the weather to clear. On this rainy day, the fisher is grateful for each small fish he manages to catch, each one meaning another mouse will be fed. The warm Indian Ocean generally has a far more pleasant climate. Gustavo and his sons set out to catch fish in the warm lagoons of Mozambique. Today the journey will require several hours of hard rowing, for the wind is not too strong and the weather unusually cold. A small gauge net through which almost nothing can escape is let out in a wide circle near a sandbank where it is shallow enough to stand. The catch is barely enough to feed everyone at home, and there will be nothing left to sell for cash to meet the family's meager needs. Today, the livelihood of subsistence artisanal fishers around the world is in jeopardy. Part of the reason is the stiff competition they suffer from industrial fishers 
that are far better equipped to feed humanity's insatiable appetite for marine products. The industrial revolution and modern lifestyle have turned many coastal seas into disaster areas. The demand for marine protein has devastated marine resources. The uncontrolled use of large-scale industrialized vessels have put nine out of the world's 17 major fishing grounds in serious decline. 70% of the world's marine fish stocks are fully exploited, overexploited, depleted, or recovering only very slowly. Here in the cold Humboldt current, the richest capture fishery in the world, 600 tons of anchovy will be captured in one morning. Yet top quality fish, a rich source of omega-3 fatty acids, is mostly being converted into food supplements for animal feed. Globally, this practice results in fewer fish and smaller fish being caught, fishing down the food chain upon which all marine life depends. As the population of anchovies decline, it becomes imperative to improve management practices. Even rich marine ecosystems such as the Humboldt could become depleted in the future, with disastrous consequences for local fishermen, the global economy, and marine life, repeating an increasingly common pattern of marine resource depletion. Illegal fishing adds greatly to the depletion problem. Not even the sharks, now fast disappearing, are spared. Accidentally caught bycatch, like this turtle, become unintended victims. Most of them will be discarded dead. Some will be eaten. Even fewer will be saved. These turtles are simply collateral damage when a billion people worldwide depends on the oceans for their food and survival. The list of the condemned grows, whether hunted down and caught intentionally, or by simply ending up in a net by accident. The corpses of marine mammals, such as dolphins, have become a common sight in our oceans globally. This degradation of our seas is a global phenomena, occurring in large marine ecosystems flanking both developing and developed countries. Exports of marine products to the developed countries through the use of subsidized fishing fleets further fuel the depletion. The global coastal ecosystem is at risk, and both food security and socio-economic future of coastal regions are in jeopardy. More and more European, North American, and industrialized Asian nations are importing fish from the developing world to replace their already depleted stocks at the expense of developing countries' food security. These industrial fishing fleets also threaten the livelihoods of fishing communities. With the European fleet more than 40% larger than what the available fish stocks can accommodate, marine resource depletion has expanded to the southern Mediterranean, to West Africa and South America. Despite the $16 billion a year international trade in fisheries, developing countries receive relatively little benefit in terms of fees from distant fishing fleets. The biggest problem of our oceans is that the fisheries in the large marine ecosystems are overfished and are terribly stressed. And this has terrible implications for the people of the world that depend on the fisheries for their livelihoods and for their food security. In addition to fishing pressures, other human activities cause habitat destruction and pollution that increasingly threaten disaster for the abundant life of large marine ecosystems. The beach draws humans like a magnet, and much of the world's coastal areas have become overpopulated, altering coastal habitats which support large marine ecosystems. The demands of coastal as well as inland people have led to large-scale commerce and industry along the coasts, since the seas still provide the cheapest possibilities for bulk transport.
agricultural fertilizer and pesticides pollute our erstwhile pristine rivers, and almost all of them flow into the sea. Excessive nitrogen pollution has over-fertilized coastal waters, fueling harmful algal blooms, now larger and more frequent than ever before. These blooms decay robs oxygen from coastal waters, destroying seabed habitats, harming fisheries and biological diversity. On our present course, nitrogen pollution running down rivers into coastal ecosystems will increase globally by 50% between 1990 and 2050. This shocking footage shows part of the Baltic seabed. With little or no oxygen in this water, it has become sterile and unsuitable for almost any form of life. Since the industrial and green revolutions, most of Earth's oceans have suffered tremendous losses. The legacy of commercial overfishing, accelerated pollution loadings, and the destruction of coastal habitats have devastated life in large marine ecosystems. Industrial development has also contributed to a drastic rise in marine traffic. With more oil tankers and hazardous cargo ships, the risk of pollution of marine habitats is increasing worldwide. Some pollution is deliberate. Here in the Baltic Sea, a thick oily residue from ships' discarded ballast water covers the shore. Large teams were deployed to clean up the mess, but the effects lingered on. When a bulk oil carrier sank in the southern part of the Benguela current, thousands of tons of heavy oil and lighter fuel oil spilled into the sea. Thick, sticky oil rendered almost the entire population of endemic jackass penguins helpless. 4,000 chicks starved to death on nearshore islands. In the end, the world's largest seabird rescue mission, with massive human coordination and voluntary effort, saved 95% of 20,000 oiled birds from death. If the pace of large oil spills continues, with over a dozen in the region since 1968, these rare penguins may soon face extinction. Overfishing, excess of bycatch, illegal fishing, habitat destruction, marine pollution. But there is hope. These far-reaching issues have finally caught the world's attention. Now, at the beginning of this century, a common global understanding is emerging. The degradation of marine life is crisis for all of humanity and humanity together must respond. I think we all know that there's very significant cause for concern for oceans at the global level. 76% of fisheries are in trouble. 70% of marine mammals are estimated as threatened. 58% of coral reefs are threatened. 46 million people per year are at risk for flooding. No longer can we attempt to manage our oceans on a single country by country basis only. Political borders simply do not correlate with our natural marine ecosystems. And this reality had to be faced. At the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, nations committed to reducing marine and land-based sources of pollution, to creating protected areas for marine biodiversity, and to restoring fish stocks to sustainable levels by 2015. They also encouraged global use of an ecosystem approach to realize these goals. Dr. Ken Sherman, a world expert in management of large marine ecosystems, or LMEs, explains. The unique aspect of the large marine ecosystem approach is that it's science-based. And it's science-based around naturally occurring large areas of the globe that are adjacent to the land masses that are the most highly productive in the oceans. In fact, 
they produce 95% of the world's marine fisheries every year. There are also places that are most highly polluted because of their proximity to dense coastal populations. Leading up to the Johannesburg summit, pioneering work by lead scientists identified a total of 64 large marine ecosystems on our planet, like the Baltic Sea, the Benguela Current, and the Humboldt Current. Most of these LMEs extend across the coasts of several countries. These 64 large marine ecosystems produce an astonishing 95% of the world's annual yield for marine fisheries. Importantly, the delimitation of each LME is determined by its ecological functionality and physical parameters, rather than political boundaries. Large marine ecosystems are natural regions of coastal ocean space, encompassing waters from river basins and estuaries to the seaward boundaries of the continental shelf and outer margins of coastal currents. As humans are using the coastline more and more for development, there's a degradation of habitats. There are the loss of mangroves. There are the loss of seagrasses. There are some uh, impacts that are negative on coral reefs. So therefore, uh, for this next 10-year period, it's a high priority to uh, invest what we know about these large marine ecosystems from a scientific basis to a linkage that demonstrates their socioeconomic value to societies that live on their landward boundaries. Learning about the natural forces affecting LMEs permits us to better understand and address how human actions perturb those forces. Thus, at its core, the LME approach blends science and stewardship to reduce coastal pollution from land, rivers, and ships, restore damaged marine habitats, such as coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses, and recover depleted fisheries so that they may be sustained and help sustain humanity indefinitely. Using this LME approach, an international convention has conserved marine life around Antarctica for over a generation. More than 30 nations now cooperate to protect the unintended killing of seabirds, marine mammals, and bottom-dwelling fish. Their partnership addresses more than just fishing, however. Nations also consider impacts from oil and mineral exploration, pollution, and global climate change in order to conserve the entire marine ecosystem surrounding Antarctica. The effort thus serves as a model for an emerging large marine ecosystem approach to managing coastal waters. Could this same ecosystem approach be used to sustain marine life closer to civilization's shores? Indeed, the LME concept has recently evolved into a holistic yet practical ecosystem approach that is now endorsed and supported by governments nationally and internationally for the benefit of nature and people. Since 1995, the Global Environment Facility, or GEF, has been assisting developing nations to cooperate in pioneering the LME approach for the ecosystem-based management of coastal and marine resources. The oceans of the world know no boundaries. They flow from country to country. That is why the natural management units, like large marine ecosystems, are so important for GEF to use to accomplish its mission. The large marine ecosystems approach also fits the mission of the Global Environment Facility to muster global collective financing power to bring about sustainable use of our planet's resources. Its successful implementation will require a strong scientific basis and a holistic philosophy. The GEF assists developing countries in planning and implementing LME projects based on an assessment that considers ecosystem productivity, fish and fishery, pollution and ecosystem health, socioeconomics, and governance. Once countries agree on the issues facing their marine resources, 
their root causes and strategies for improvement, the GEF can provide additional funding to help implement actions that realize those strategies. The results of this new approach are becoming visible, even in what is one of the world's most polluted large marine ecosystems, the Baltic Sea. Countries have started to work together through the adoption of a GEF large marine ecosystem strategy. All that is needed is political will and collaboration between all parties. Already dramatic positive changes towards recovery are visible. The Baltic Sea has started on its long road to recovery. Ever so slowly will its waters become less and less polluted. When that happens, the efforts of all involved will pay off on a grand scale. With pollution reduction efforts, current salmon restocking efforts will be duplicated many times over, so the Baltic Sea can again feed nations with its proudest marine product. Many developing countries are taking the lead in adopting GEF LME strategy, and Africa is already ahead dealing with issues such as fisheries and pollution across several LMEs. On the sidelines of the GEF assembly in 2006, Angola, Namibia and South Africa signed a historic agreement creating a new Benguela Current Commission. This LME agreement was the first of its kind anywhere in the world. The new commission will help these nations to jointly and sustainably manage transboundary pollution, shared fish stocks, and ecological impacts of marine mining and fossil fuel production. To share the transfer of practical LME experiences from places like the Baltic Sea and Benguela Current to other LME regions, the GEF also sponsors a series of international waters conferences. Representatives from LME projects around the world come together to learn from one another and return home with new tools and common agenda to restore the world's fisheries and sustain life in our oceans. Perhaps at their next meeting in South Africa, they will learn a few timeless lessons from the nearby fisherfolk. In southern Africa, the system of traditional traps used by the Temba Tonga people has been in use for over 500 years, with virtually no impact on the fish stocks. Palisades are permanently deployed among the estuary, and the ownership and responsibility for sound management of these traps are passed from generation to generation. Here, there is enough fish to feed one's family, while small fish are allowed to escape and grow up to breed, so food is available from one year to the next. The tide is turning. Among the Tembi Tonga, around Antarctica, across the Baltic Sea and Benguela currents are flowing common themes. The oceans can recover if we allow it. In partnership with the GEF, Countries are now working together to apply LME management techniques to restore our marine heritage. No matter where we live, we cannot afford to lose this new momentum. More and more countries need to be united in this new hope. After all, we live together on this small and immensely fragile blue planet with a surface that consists mostly of water. The time has come for every person to respect and restore our oceans and coasts. For the sake of those whose life depends on it, for ourselves and for our future. To learn more about the GEF and its LME projects, please contact the GEF or its International Waters Learn Project. For more information on the status of specific LMEs, please visit the website Large Marine Ecosystems of the World. <laughs>